Just waiting on the key. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, good, 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 good. Let's just hope it before the snow comes in. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Are we ready? Okay. Okay, we are going to go ahead and reconvene. We ended with Dr. Hahn's presentation on the administration of plasamycin. And the current coding options, if desired, facilities can report the administration of plasamycin with one of the following ICD-10 PCS codes. These codes come from Table 3E0. 3E03329, Introduction of Other Anti-Infective Interperipheral Vein, Percutaneous Approach. And Code 3E04329, Introduction of Other Anti-Infective into Central Vein, percutan Percutaneous Approach. Coding options include Option 1. Do not create new codes for the administration of plasamycin. Continue to use the current codes as just described. Option two, create new codes in section X, new technology to identify intravenous infusion of plasamycin. CMS is recommending option two, creating new codes in section X, new technology to identify the, inf the intravenous infusion of plasamycin. Again, this is a new technology. Are there any questions on the floor regarding the administration of plasamycin or the coding options? It's not a question, just a comment. Linda Holtzman from Clarity Coding. I just wanted to comment that I think that this is a proper use of Section X. Thank and you. I like seeing this here in Section X. Thank you, Ms. Holtzman. Moderator, please open the line for questions. Do we have the moderator on the line? We'll give her a second or two. We have a question in the audience. Uh, Jeff Lindsay, or comments. Um, and it, it may be my <clears throat> a lack of uh, full knowledge of PCS, 
uh, despite what Nellie tries to do. But um, why would you have a code for a particular antibiotic that's in a group of antibiotics that may not have unique codes? I mean, genomycin, amicacin, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> if there are other means of capturing this uh, medication, I don't see why it would need a PCS code. You don't understand why it would be a PCS code at all? Correct. Not just a Section X PCS Correct. code. Again, um, the, the options are if desired, the code could be uh, reported. It's not mandatory. But thank you for your comment and your question. Sue Bowman, I'll just respond to Dr. Linzer's comment because <laughs> a lot of people in the room know how I feel about Section X. But um, <laughs> it's not a positive feeling. But a lot of it has to do, uh, Dr. Linzer, with the, um, the new technology add-on payment and if it gets that add-on payment needing a way to capture that specific medication in order for the um, add-on payment to be administered to the hospital. I personally have always thought that there were other mechanisms and other ways outside of PCS that we could capture that information, but I've lost that battle a long time ago, so <laughs> that's why we have codes for those sorts of things. Thank you, Sue. Moderator, are there any questions on the line? I thought I heard a beeping in. Yes. The lines are unmuted. Thank you. Are there any questions on the line regarding the administration of plasomycin and the coding options associated? Okay, hearing no questions, we will continue with the next item on our agenda, and Maddie Way will introduce the next topic. Welcome back from lunch, everyone. We're on page 39 of your agenda and handout packet. The issue is uh, percutaneous extracorporeal membrane ox oxygenation, or ECMO, for cardiopulmonary insufficiency. And currently, there is not a unique uh, PCS code for percutaneous ECMO. It's not a new technology application. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Vetrovec. Good afternoon. I hope everyone had a good lunch and is still wide awake. Um, we'll be brief. Um, I'm Dr. George Vetrovec, a professor emeritus at Virginia Commonwealth University, cardiologist with a long academic career uh, in clinical medicine, but also running a division and a cardiac cath lab, and also nationally in uh, being on the at one time Board of the American Heart, American College of Cardiology, and President of the SCA and I. Uh, I'm uh, a consultant for Abiumed, which makes uh, pumps that are used to support the heart and are all often used in conjunction with uh, ECMO. And they're also uh, developing other technologies in that, in that uh, area. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to try to make some points that will make this uh, relevant and, and helpful. And I, I want to congratulate the coders today because each of us is presenting in a very small area and one sees how diverse all of this is and, and coders are expected to know all of this. So I, I clearly have always had a respect for how this was done and, and the effort that it takes, but I think I've developed an even greater understanding today. Um, so ECMO is a procedure that provides an opportunity to bypass the lungs and to provide flow back into the systemic circulation to oxygenate uh, the tissues. Now, it's important to know that ECMO is a generic term for this procedure. There are multiple vendors, and even within hospitals, these vendors use interchangeable equipment. So this is not defined by a particular t 
type. It's not a Kleenex or it's not a, a specific type. ECMO is the generic term. It's very well understood. And I don't think there's confusion because I think that was that is the term that will be used. Some of the issues that I'm speaking to, however, are defining the types of ECMO. And there's veno arterial, or VA as I'll refer to it going forward, ECMO, which provides both flow and oxygenation. And then there's veno venous, or VV ECMO, which provides really oxygenation only. And I'll explain those. The other issue is, is the placement of the device as to whether it's central or whether it's percutaneous. Historically, it was central, but now it's moved into being peripheral or percutaneous in its insertion. At the present time, the ICD coding for ECMO is not sufficiently uh, specific to describe uh, the diverse approaches and types of support provided by uh, ECMO. So let me see if I can make some of these points a little bit better. First of all, there are a whole series of support pumps for patients who are having predominantly cardiac failure acutely and or um, uh, respiratory uh, or oxygenation problems from the so-called PVADs, the Impella line of pumps, ECMO, which we're talking about today, but there are external LVADs, implantable LVADs, but we'll really focus on the ECMO today. And in terms of the pumps, um, they, pro they all provide oxygenation, some in addition providing flow, so the distinction being whether they're a respiratory or oxygenation support, or whether they're oxygenation plus circulation or cardiac in their function. The circuit that they have is they are basically taking venous blood and putting it through an external oxygenator, warming it, pumping it back into the uh, circulation to then uh, recirculate this blood within the body. So the cannulation for this, as I said, traditionally was central, which required a thoracotomy, opening the chest, placing tubes in the central vessels around the heart, but it's now become more common to do this peripherally, oftentimes even placed in, in the cath lab or other places than an operating room, by putting large tubes into the peripheral arteries and veins, usually in the uh, femoral area. So what we're going to try to define is what these differences are. So again, here's the VA ECMO, central versus peripheral. On the right, you see central cannulation, which is significant in that it has a thoracotomy and it has central cannulation. The peripheral uh, ECMO has the lines placed in the femoral artery and vein and provides the circulation support without need for a thoracotomy, which is obviously an advantage for uh, patients. Now, there's some unique characteristics of the peripheral ECMO. It basically removes blood from the right side of the heart, returns that blood to the systemic artery, that's the so-called uh, VA ECMO system, and it really loads the left side of the heart, and at times, uh, the, it creates left ventricular distension because the aortic valve does not open properly from this uh, backflow, and various venting mechanisms uh, have to be uh, added. Now, in terms of the VA ECMO configuration, just to look at the VA, remember that's veno ar arterial. You see the blood is in this case taken from the um, uh, uh, superior uh, uh, vena cava here and uh, circulated through the system, which oxygenates it and warms it, and it's pumped back into the arterial system peripherally, and again without an open chest configuration. And then this is the VV ECMO, which is focusing not on flow and oxygenation, but just in oxygenation for generally significant pulmonary problems. And you see the blood is taken from uh, a peripheral vein here, circulated through the uh, oxygenator and warming device, and then 
pumped back into the uh, right atrium, just recycling on the venous side to oxygenate the uh, blood. Now this table, I won't go through, but it really focuses on the differences in the veno arterial or VA ECMO versus the v veno, veno venous or VV ECMO. And again, the major considerations are whether it provides cardiopulmonary support plus hemodynamic support in the case of VA ECMO or whether it just provides respiratory support in the case of VV ECMO. Now, in terms of, uh, excuse me, in terms of um, documentation for this, which I know is a big issue in terms of this, I'm going to show you two very complicated cases that you can't possibly read on the slides, but hopefully since you have the handouts, you can see that it's actually relatively easy to make this distinction as to whether it's uh, central or whether it's peripheral. This first example is of an open ECMO, and if you read through it very quickly, you quickly see that there's a Reopening, this is a re-entry, reopening of the uh, mediastinum, they clean it out, they, uh, at the end, they're reclosing. It's very easy to see that this is an open case. And in contrast, the next one is a peripheral ECMO in which you very quickly read and see that the uh, cannula is put in with a cut down that's done over an existing intraortic balloon pump in the artery, and that's the arterial cannulation. So I think this distinct distinction is easy because what happens in these cases is just part of what a, a physician writes in the medical record. And the coding of VV and VA is very clear because this is a very common term that's used throughout. So I think this is not as stressful as one might think in terms of making these distinctions. And again, these are all the possible terminologies on the left-hand side for open sternotomy ECMO as opposed to percutaneous ECMO on the right. These are kind of buzzwords, the things that you can see in the record to uh, trigger the thought of is how this is uh, actually done. So, uh, substantial changes have occurred in ECMO. I've implied this. It started out mostly for pediatrics, mostly for oxygenation, always central um, thoracotomy related, and now it's moved much more into being more commonly put in for adults who are less sick but need support, who are uh, not, who, who you want to avoid the thoracotomy and do it peripherally. So this is the more common. And uh, the patient selection has gotten beyond just a moribund patient to being really a, an attempt to salvage, recover, or provide support until a new, another therapy can be uh, provided. Uh, and that can be anything from heart transplant to uh, bypass surgery and, and so forth. Um, so in summary, ECMO has evolved. Um, it allows now percutaneous su support. It's uh, frequently um, much less resource intensive than it used to be. It's used in less severely ill patients who have a real opportunity to recover. Um, a single code for both peripheral and open ECMO make it difficult for CMS to track and monitor the claims data and to really accurately report ECMO procedures and what goes into them and how they're done, unique codes are needed. And this more granular approach is consistent, as I understand it, uh, with the goals for uh, ICD-10. So thank you very much, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Moderator, can you open up the phone lines? Are there any clinical questions? All lines are now unmuted. Okay, we'll go ahead and turn to the coding options. If you're following along in your packet, we're on page 40. The current coding would be 5A15223 for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation continuous. 
Option one is do not create new codes. Option two would be in table 5A1, we would create new qualifier value F for membrane peripheral to apply to the um, body system for cardiac and respiratory and the duration value would remain continuous. And then in addition, we would re revise the existing qualifier three membrane to membrane central. And this would enable additional detail to distinguish ECMO procedures requiring central cannulation using the um, open sternotomy approach from the peripheral or percutaneous approach. And CMS is recommending option two. Do we have any comments? We have one on the floor. Lynn Keen, Keen Consulting. The, um, that first row where we're adding cardiac and respiratory with the peripheral, I just need some clarification. I know it was mentioned that the, the peripheral version is used in the less severely ill patients. I'm not sure how a coder will be able to determine that it is used for respiratory support only versus both. Can, could you help with that and what we might see in the documentation? I, I'm, I think you're likely to see in the, in, the, in the documentation VV or VA because those are very commonly used terms yes. um, by the surgeons or now some cardiologists are implanting that. So I think that would be a trigger that you're likely to see in there. Um, the other would be just anything that would define the patient as having not shock, but having a respiratory problem, such as someone who's got pneumonia from uh, influenza. This has been, with the recent influenza, this has been a use for some of the VV ECMO uh, uh, opportunities, as opposed to some uh, patient that's in shock where they need the VA ECMO for not only the oxygenation, but the flow. Okay, so help me understand then. If it is the VV ECMO, the coder would be assigning respiratory only? Correct. And then if it's a VA ec peripheral ECMO, we would be assigning circulatory with the qualifier of peripheral. Is this correct? Well, I, I'm not a coder, so, so I think that it would be important that it has both respiratory and uh, cardiac for the VA ECMO. But I think we're using the circulatory for that now as open chest ECMO. Right. Uh, I, you Mandy may is, be, but I... Can but, you help interpret, Mandy? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the table as well, trying to show him how we have it right now. So um, you can either look there or look here. Okay. <laughs> so right now we go the open here, so that would be this row with the right. membrane. Okay. So up here we had that the VA would be um, providing respiratory and right. circulatory. So that would be the combination of these two codes. I get you, you would, certainly VA would include circulatory and respiratory. Now, however you get that coding. Okay, all right. So he's saying, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, my, a my answer is, is again, I'm not a coder to know how to put this together. But for the VA ECMO, I think it, it's important that you would be doing both circulatory and respiratory respiratory and would need to okay. to include that. Okay, so then the follow-up question is, in the first row, the body system says cardiac, with it as peripheral as the method. I'm not understanding when we would be using the cardiac alone for the rest of the heart, I mean resting the heart versus not doing the oxygen. Again, I don't know the coding. Uh, there are certainly patients in whom the, the, the major reason for the ECMO is to support the circulation because of, say, shock, and respiration is sort of a secondary component of that. But once they start circulating, they need to support the respir respiratory. So I'm not 100% sure, but again, I don't know the coding in what situation you would want to try to isolate just the cardiac from the respiratory. So are you saying that we so, could probably get rid of cardiac I'm looking and for just backup keep here. respiratory Do we need unless, to unless do Unless someone need? wants to disagree with me, uh, I would think that you could do, remove okay. the cardiac and it would be just, car, VA would be cardiac and respiratory. Okay, I yeah. took a little straw poll here quickly, yeah. and it seems like cardiac may not be necessary yep. in the table. That's what we just decided up here as well. <laughs> So 
So you, you request for this particular procedure to be added because between the peripheral and the central, that's all you need, right? We don't really care about the body system where it's actually in cardiac or respiratory. Right now, it's so easy for coder to pick one code, regardless <laughs> what, right? So if you only want for the central, which is an open procedure, compared to percutaneous, then just change the qualifier and leave the ECMO that we have, but the, the qualifier to be central or open approach, um, the for is gonna be percutaneous approach. That is so much easier for us because when we know when you actually open the heart, you know, we, we coder do understand that different. And we know when you're inserting a, a line into from, um, femoral artery. I don't, I don't know how the coding steps. Right. I think it's well, very important to realize that these are markedly different procedures when it's central with a thoracotomy right. versus peripheral. So you can capture under qualifier under the central versus peripheral. Then that's it. Okay. And leave what we have alone. Yeah, I, I think part. the the request involved being able to also differentiate the VA from the VV. Then, then you can add in an underbody system, VA or VE, <laughs> but cardiac and respiratory, I can tell you one, you that 99% 99, 99 provider will not tell me I'm doing this ECMO for cardiac or respiratory. You can send that in your written comments. <laughs> Um, Gene Yoder, Lidos Defense Health Agency. I, I really like changing that membrane central and membrane peripheral. I, I like changing that because that, that really tells a difference because there's a big difference in what's done. And then I like which system you're supporting, which is, uh, are, are you supporting it because of the fluid or are you supporting it because of the uh, oxygen? And so, I, yeah, if you just chuck that add to cardiac, I, I will. Thank you, Jean. All right, thank you. Jeff Windsor, AAP. The majority of the uh, patients uh, on ECMO are in the pediatric population currently. <clears throat> the trying to differentiate the body system, I think, could be very difficult because I don't think the physician is going to document that the patients on ECMO for respiratory versus cardiac means. So I don't see any need to <clears throat> add an addition there. I think under the qualifier to indicate um, central, and then I agree that there should be a peripheral for venous venous and a separate qualifier for venous arterial, that that would capture the information that's probably most important that I think uh, the systems would be looking for. Thank you, Dr. Lenzer. Yeah, can I just make, it, it's my understanding that actually today, and I'm not a pediatrician, um, there, because of the, the rapid increase in using ECMO, it's actually used more in adults now than pediatrics. Its history is clearly in pediatrics. Uh, Sue Bowman, my only concern with, I understand the issue of, you know, figuring out whether it's circulatory or respiratory, but we have the body system character now, and I guess I'd be very concerned coding it as circulatory if it's really respiratory only. That seems quite inaccurate to me. So I think going down this structure, you know, we're going to have to be able to differentiate. My other comment is, and it's only because Teresa Rohanek hasn't gotten up to the microphone, so I thought I would support her earlier comments about concerns about changing an existing qualifier that's being used for both uh, and now saying it's central only, which has, is changing the meaning then of all the, the previous ones, which I think is very concerning. Thank you. I'll look forward to your written comments, Sue. Moderator, can we open up the phone? Oh, we've got one more. Sorry, Nelly. Actually, it's a follow-up question because I was trying to listen very carefully. Um, doctor, you were saying that traditionally ECMO was central and now more commonly it's being done peripherally. So is that how the decision was made? And maybe, maybe it's not fair, maybe it's a Maddie question. Is that how the decision was made that if you wanted to reuse or change the, uh, or refine the meaning of the existing um, qualifier three to make it central? Is it because central was more common? 
because I thought you were saying that now peripheral is more common. Peripheral is more common now. <clears throat> Central is uh, much more, at least in adults, limited to people coming out of the operating room who aren't coming off pump well or something like that. It's, it's much less common to take them to the operating room and put it in centrally. It's put in peripherally. Okay. Then this uh, supports Teresa's uh, suggestion that we should not be reusing a value because I think that it's, if someone is, look, is going to look at previous data, we won't know what it means that it changed and we'll either think that, oh, they were only doing um, uh, central before and that must have been the most common one and that's why it was changed. But that's not correct. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank grinning. you for your comments, Nelly. Do you have anybody else from the floor? Okay, moderator, can we open up the phone lines again to see if there's any comments for the coding? All lines are now unmuted. Okay. Um, interim coding advice is to continue to code as stated in current coding, and I look forward to getting your written comments on this proposal. And I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle Joshua. Good afternoon again. <clears throat> the next item on our agenda is spinal fusion with hydroxyapatite enhanced interbody fusion device. And here to present the procedure and describe the procedure is Dr. John Devine. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you for the opportunities to present here today on a radiolucent hydroxyapatite peak uh, for spinal fusion. I represent uh, Invibio, who are a, a biomaterials company. Um, we uh, invented, developed, and commercialized peak polymer-based biomaterials. These are strong structural materials often used to replace metals. And we provide our materials to medical device companies in areas such as dental, orthopedic trauma and spine, which I want to talk to you about today. Oh, sorry. So currently no code exists to track spinal fusions using radiolucent hydroxyapatite peak material. Uh, there's no visual difference between this new material and uh, standard peak materials and a new ICD-10 code would allow us to better track the real-life use of the material beyond planned controlled clinical studies. So a little bit about spinal fusion. Uh, obviously, the goal is to relieve the patient's pain by restoring disc height using a strong structural material. Um, that cage can then contain the graft material, which can be autographed, allograft, or synthetic. Um, and the goal is to get a good primary uh, stability for that segment and eventually to promote fusion uh, across the two vertebrae and relieve the pain. So why do people use PEAK today? Um, principally because of Wolf's Law, and Wolf's Law, Law tells us that bone will model and remodel based on the stress that the bone feels. And one thing that PEAK is extremely good at doing is in transferring that stress. So when we have the loading uh, through the spine, peak distributes that stress to the, to the bone and into the graft space, promoting fusion. And when we use uh, stiffer materials like titanium, uh, one of the problems can be that bone is shielded from the stress that it normally sees. The bone starts to resorb away from the implant, and we can see that cage sink down into the, the vertebra, and we can see pain come back. Um, so today, PEAK is actually used in something like 70% of all spinal fusion procedures um, because of these benefits and because of the imaging benefit as well. You can see on the images on the screen, uh, we can really see what's happening in the fusion mass, what's happening at the end plates uh, compared to titanium devices where we really can't tell what's going on in that fusion space. Um, because of its popularity, it's been extensively studied. 
but there are so many different designs of spinal fusion cages, so many different options for graft materials, it's really hard to come across good, high-quality comparative data. Um, there is a few studies we found, sort of four uh, reasonably high-level um, studies that compared the fusion rate and subsidence rates between peak and titanium devices. Both actually provide uh, pretty good fusion outcomes, uh, peak slightly more consistent, but where we do see some significant differences is when we look at the subsidence of those materials um, into the lower vertebra, where peak definitely has uh, less propensity to subside. So uh, despite these good clinical outcomes, um, surgeons are and hospitals are looking for um, ways to improve upon peak materials and titanium materials. Um, we can see that they're trying to do this by new technologies for bone ingrowth and on growth. So you can see some of these 3D printed, additive manufactured porous metal cages where the goal is to get the bone to grow into and through the pores in the material to give us that primary stability. And you can see some of the innovations that have taken place with peak-based devices where companies are coating them with uh, roughened titanium coatings on the end plates to give us uh, a better bone on growth uh, at the top and the bottom of the cages and better initial stability. So what I wanted to uh, tell you about today was our approach towards improving uh, these clinical outcomes with peak-based materials uh, through this new material, uh, hydroxyapatite peak. So what we've done is we've combined hydroxyapatite, which is a, a mineral you find in, in uh, human bone. We've combined that with peak materials to give us a really well consolidated and integrated uh, structure, which uh, device companies can then machine devices out of. And uh, you can see from the image on the screen here that we see um, hydroxyapatite particles are then available, not just at the end plates, but at every single surface in the cage. And these particles, which are about five micron in size, are osteoconductive. So we keep all the benefits of peak cages, such as their modulus, their imaging, but we get this osteoconductive effect. Um, why hydroxyapatite? I've mentioned it's osteoconductive, bone chemically bonds to it. It's biocompatible. Uh, we use a highly crystalline form so that it doesn't resorb away. Um, and it gives us this osteoconductive load-bearing implant. It's not a coating, so there's no risks for the surgeon of delamination. It's basically well integrated and available at all surfaces. And hydroxyapatite has got a really strong clinical history. Um, uh, as a coating in dental implants on, on hip stems. Um, and we just thought it was a really, really nice approach to take some of the materials that you might typically see in the graft space and to uh, incorporate that in the actual fusion cage such that the whole cage can participate in the fusion. Um, so if we, if we look at maybe some of the key material factors in achieving good clinical outcomes, we would say they are the cage has got to be strong enough to withstand loads. It's got to have the right modulus to distribute the stress. It's got to actively participate in the fusion. And it's got to be easily imaged under various imaging modalities to understand what's happening um, with the patient as they progress, hopefully, towards a complete fusion. And we would say that of the various options that's available today in terms of technologies, uh, hydroxyapatite peak is one of the few that does score well in each of those four uh, critical factors. We've undertaken various preclinical and clinical studies to determine uh, what the benefit has been, always comparing to the, the gold standard, which is standard peak materials today. Uh, we've done a simple uh, bone defect model uh, where we look at how the material responds to uh, cortical and cancellous bone. Uh, the study here shows that we see a far um, better early bone response. We see far more bone in contact with the HA-enhanced materials than we do with standard peak materials at 4 and 12 weeks. And the histology slide here, uh, the bottom one, you can see that the bone grows up to and onto uh, the HA material, whereas in the top slide, we can see the bone grows up to, but we see a really small white line where we've got some fibrous tissue between uh, peak and the bone. The, uh, 
the difficulty with this study, it's non-loaded, so we don't have the typical loads you'd have in fusion. We don't have the motion you'd have at a segment, and so we progress to um, a more challenging um, cervical uh, fusion model. Uh, Follow-up here at 6, 12, and 26 weeks. This time, we're not just looking at the bone that's in contact with, with the device. We're also trying to understand how much new bone is deposited in that graft space because we have got hydroxyapatite particles available at all of the device. Um, this study is published as is the previous um, study in the peer-reviewed literature. We see, um, I guess, considerable new bone formation again at the early time points of six weeks, but we also see higher quality of new bone bridging uh, within the graft space at six and at 12 weeks when we compare it with standard peak materials. And I think you can really see from the micro CT images here the difference between uh, the six week uh, image on the top uh, left and the HA peak on the bottom left. <clears throat> so preclinically, we do seem to see differentiated performance uh, from the material in a fusion environment. Uh, I just want to. Um, summarize some of the clinical work that's been done. This is a 20 patient case series from uh, Dr. Timothy Bassett at Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, this is his patient population. It's maybe worth noting that 45% um, of the patients being operated on here, this was a failed primary fusion. So these, these patients are unfortunately having revision surgery. Um, a certain amount of the population have some of the risk factors that we would associate with fusion, so smokers or diabetics. And 65% um, of patients are using some form of pain meds before surgery. If we look at the outcomes, so uh, CT scans were taken at six months, so a fairly early time point. Um, and we see that we've got 75%, 74% of patients fused at six months by CT. Um, the other six are progressing towards fusion. 80% uh, of patients have seen significant improvements in, in uh, VAS back scores. Uh, even higher population of patients have almost no leg pain at all. 92% of patients are now off of pain medication. And we start to see, which we don't see really with standard peak materials, we start to see this dense bone so this uh, new bone is forming, it appears very dense and healthy, and we see that in 61% of all the levels that we're operated on, and that's something we don't typically see. <clears throat> this is one patient who was a 76-year-old female, so a little bit older than the average age of the fusion patient. Um, spondylolisthesis at L4-5 with stenosis. Um, Patient notes say that this patient could walk no more than 100 yards prior to the operation. Um, CT was taken 163 days post-op, so we're just over five months. We see death, dense bone apposition around the implant. Patient's fully fused. Um, we, this is something we see over and over again, this dense, this dense bone that says we're, we're really seeing something different clinically. Um, and the patient is now able to visit the gym five, five days a week. So a really nice case. Um, from that series there. So these are uh, Dr. Bassett's conclusions and not mine. Uh, very rapid visible bone fusion in the interbody region. He sees it as little as six weeks post-op, and that's really helpful in getting this initial stability towards fusion. Um, he sees 17 or 23 levels, as we say, demonstrated complete fusion, uh, good relief of, of uh, pain, both in, in back and leg pain. And at the time of putting the case series together, he had operated on 108 levels, um, all TLF, no expensive biologics used in any of these patients. Everything was uh, autograph only. He has one revision and zero planned revision, so he's very happy with what he's seeing. Uh, there's now 28 different devices cleared in the US that utilize this hydroxyapatite peak material. Uh, it's used in a range of um, different applications, both cervical and lumbar, and standalone and VBR. As I say, we're not a medical device company, we're a biomaterials company, so we do find it hard to always track and understand where our material's going, but we think we have about 6,000 devices implanted now in um, more than 390 hospitals here in the US. Um, as I say, we, um, 
we, we do and we would like to track how our material is being used in, in a real life environment. Um, there's currently no ICD-10 code. You can't visually differentiate between standard peak and hydroxyapatite peak and, and you can't tell a difference by any of the imaging modalities as well. That was me. Thank you very much. Questions? All lines are unmuted. Hi. I'm Linda Holtzman from Clarity Coding. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I'd like to note that I sometimes do um, uh, consulting with Medtronic, which has a spinal division and gets involved in fusion. Yeah. Um, but I'm speaking for myself here. Uh, my question is, is, is clinical. Um, do you see the, uh, this new material peak with hydroxyapatite, get that right? Yes. Um, eventually supplanting and replacing a classic or legacy peak? I mean, I think we do. I think um, if, you, if you're a surgeon and the clinical history starts to, to grow and you had a choice between standard peak, which is our material, and the hydroxyapatite peak, I can't imagine why you would, you would decide to use a legacy peak and not the, the new version. So we are sort of cannibalizing ourselves, but we think it's a, it's, a, it's a better clinical material. Okay. I, I was just curious as to whether we'd, we'd eventually see, you know, peak use go down and... Hydroxyapatite. Yeah. I mean, we, we provide in the different industries. So in, okay. in areas like trauma, you don't want the bone on growth. So I think there'll always be applications where bone on growth is not desired and applications okay. where it's desired. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Did we open the telephone line for questions? We did, yes, thank you. Okay, so we will review the coding options, current coding and coding options. <clears throat> current coding, code spinal fusion procedures using, appropriate using the appropriate body part value in tables 0RG and 0SG, fusion of upper joints and fusion of lower joints with the device value interbody fusion device. Coding options include, option one, do not create new ICD-10 PCS codes. Continue using codes as above in the current coding options. And again, we're reading from page uh, 42 in the agenda. Option two, create a new device value peak interbody fusion device radiolucent with hydroxyapatite for the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebral joint body part values in tables 0RG and 0SG, fusion of upper joints and lower joints body systems to identify spinal fusion procedures that use a radiolucent hydroxyapatite interbody fusion device. Option three, create new codes in section X, new technology to identify spinal fusion procedures that use a radiolucent peak interbody fusion device. Use the same spinal joint body part values as in the body system upper joints and lower joints of the med surge section. CMS recommends option three. Interim coding advice, continue to code spinal fusion procedures using the appropriate body part values in tables 0RG and 0SG, fusion of upper joints and fusion of lower joints with the device value interbody fusion device. Do we have comments either on the line or in the auditorium? All lines are unmuted. We have a question in the yeah, audience. Yeah, Nellie Lee on Chisen AHA. Um, I have a question. Uh, option three, the way it's structured, the, um, uh, the new value would be used for peak interbody fusion, whether it's the newer material or the legacy peak uh, cages. Is that correct? Because both are radiolucent, so you're not really capturing information on the new material. But, you know, I'm not saying that you have to. I'm just trying to clarify that. Yes, we did have 
quite a bit of discussion regarding these uh, inner body fusion devices. And currently, um, we do have an option, I don't have it in front of me, for um, the radiolucent without peak. So this would, this would differ from the current option available. Okay, because if I understood correctly, today peak is used in about 70% of fusions. And if that's the case, it's not new technology, right? Because I mean, I've, I've seen some uh, medical literature where they were referring to peak spinal fusions going back 10, 15 years. I mean, maybe more, I, I wasn't looking for a date. So I'm a little bit confused if this um, option, option three is meant to capture peak without making a distinction of, um, God, how do you pronounce it, hydroxyapatite, yes. then it would not be new technology. So I'm, I'm confused about why are you lumping them together, and if you are lumping them together, why would it be under new technology? Well, briefly, um, regarding the new technology um, aspect, at this time, Invibio does not, has not submitted a new technology application, and I really can't speak to the future application, so I will defer to Dr. Devine if you're aware. Well, I guess it doesn't matter, because even if there is a, a future application, you would not be able to apply this code for a, a new technology add-on payment, because you would not be able to distinguish it from the legacy peak uh, spinal fusions. Mm -hmm. That is something that we have not considered, and we will. will okay. You? Yeah, and I think, I, I think that's our, our goal, is to be able to differentiate in order to track whether this new technology code is actually, this new technology is actually providing a differentiated clinical outcome. Well, it always helps to have an extra set of eyes. I saw hydroxyapatite in the option, and it's not there. So now I understand. <laughs> Thank you, Maddie, for pointing that out. Hydroxyapatite should be included in the description. I apologize for that confusion. It was there in my eyes. <laughs> what, what Do we have another question? Say? Yes, it should read, peak interbody fusion device hydroxyapatite radiolucent. Lynn Keen, Keen Consulting. So would it, it basically read the same way as it is now displayed in option two? Is that what you're saying? It would. It, however, it would be in the new technology section X, as okay. opposed to adding it to the main <clears throat> body of the code set. Just an I'm option for consideration. I'm still a little concerned that without the need to have this as a new technology add-on payment, why is it in Section X? But I do understand that we have already got these other new variations on inner body fusion devices in the new technology section. And it's been my feeling all along that if we were going to have them, they needed to be in the zero RG and zero SG tables. So I'm still confused and I, I'm still in opposition to section X no matter what. <laughs> Thank you for your comment, Lynn. Do we have any comments or questions on the line? Uh, Sue Bowman, I, I completely agree with uh, Lynn's comment, and I'm, I'm also confused. I'm worried that people might see peak, you know, in the documentation and see peak in the code description, and whether wherever we put this new code, it, we're, the data is going to be very um, inconf confusing and misleading because we could have the, the regular peaks mix, mixed up in it because I'm concerned it may not be in the, uh, clear in the documentation or clear in the coding that we're not talking about the usual peak. It's peak with this other piece added to it. So um, I think that would just add even more confusion to the codes. Thank you. We appreciate your comments, Sue. Are there any additional questions, either on the phone or in the audience? Okay, hearing none and seeing none, we will move on to the next Oh, I'm sorry, we do have one more in the audience. <laughs> sorry, Linda. <laughs> Hi, Joe Devers, I'm with J.D. Lyman Group. And I just had a, a remark to make about 
the assignment of this code, again, as, as Nellie and the rest um, and Lynn have said, about the assignment of this code to the new technology section, we were involved in a different one that is in the addenda, which is a new technology inner body fusion device. And so I'm just wondering about the consistency of where we put new devices. Are we assigning them to med surge or are we assigning them to new technology? And that would just be a, a question as we move forward. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate your comment. And we look forward to receiving it in writing. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Devine. The next item on the agenda is the administration of Gia Prisa, and we have with us to present today Ms. Terry Detling. Thank you. Welcome. This is your pointer, and this is your move forward. I don't think I'll do the forward. Good afternoon. I'm Terry Detling, and today we are here requesting a new code for the IV administration of synthetic human angiotensin II. Geopreza is the first new vasopressor in 65 years for the treatment of septic and other distributive shock. Geopreza is a stable formulation of synthetic human angiotensin II, which is a naturally occurring peptide in the body and regulates blood pressure. Geopressa does address unmet needs and has pr uh, proved substantial clinical benefit to patients with distributive shock. It has demonstrated significant catecholamine sparing effect and it is also the first and only angio synthetic angiotensin II leveraging the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Existing codes do not include Geopreza, and La Jolla Pharmaceutical Company has submitted an NTAP application. A unique Section X code would facilitate claims processing and payment adjustments for NTAP. So a little bit about shock. Shock is characterized by hypoperfusion and loss of blood pressure control. Geopreza will be used in patients with distributive shock with various causes of the underlying hypotension, which means that patients may be assigned to various uh, DRGs. When we look at shock in the ICU, we see that shock is both deadly and costly. If you look on the left side of your screen, you'll see that there's a greater than 50% 30-day mortality rate with patients in the ICU with shock. And moving over to the other side, where you see the weighted average cost to CMS for shock is $87,282. So sorry. Thank you. It's important to understand the patient population that Geopreza will be used in. There are over a million estimated cases of shock in the U.S. per year. Of those patients, approximately 740,000 patients, 45,000 patients will require a first-line vasopressor such as norepinephrine to be added for blood pressure control. And then 42% of those patients will fail that first-line vasopressor, and a second vasopressor, such as vasopressin, will be needed um, in order to try to maintain blood pressure. And still, 63% of those patients will fail two uh, standard of care vasopressors. Geopreza now is a new viable treatment option for those patients, and strong clinical data does exist. So as I mentioned before, Geopreza is the only available vasopressor that utilizes the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And why this is clinically important is if you, the body has three systems that it utilizes to maintain and control blood pressure. There's the sympathetic nervous system, and that's um, the catecholamine drugs, such as norepinephrine, work through that system. Then there's an arginine vasopressin system through which vasopressin works. And finally, there's a renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system through which geopreza works. 
So GEOPRESA, in combination with these complementary mechanisms of action, will more closely mimic our body's natural ability to regulate and control blood pressure. GEOPRESA was evaluated in a phase three clinical trial called ATHOS-3, and in that trial, the primary endpoint was assessing the ability of GEOPRESA to raise mean arterial pressure, or MAP, within the first three hours of the onset of administration. And as you can see by the graph there, significantly more GEOPRESA treated patients achieved the primary endpoint compared to placebo. Additionally, the administration of GEOPRESA showed a rapid increase in the mean arterial pressure. As you can see, there's on the um, graph, there's that rapid uptick on the blue, and those are the patients receiving GEOPRESA. And then that increase in blood pressure was sustained over the 48 hours of the trial. As I mentioned before, GEOPRESA leads to a reduction in background vasopressors. So as you see, the green line represents the dose of background vasopressors, and they were titrated down during the entire 48-hour period of the trial. When we looked back, they saw that at the, um, looking at the onset of administration to hour three, there was a significant reduction in background vasopressor doses in those patients receiving Geopreza as compared to placebo. Now, Athos 3 was not powered to show mortality. However, when we adjusted for age and uh, gender, the survival gr in the Geopreza group was significantly greater. I do want to mention that um, as a result of the trial, there was a significant increase, or there was a higher incidence in arterial and venous thrombotic and thromboembolic events in patients who received Geopreza as compared to patients receiving placebo, and that rate was 13% versus 5%. The major imbalance seen was in deep vein thrombosis. So as a result of that, it is um, recommended that concurrent venous thromboembolism prophylaxis, or VTE prophylaxis, be administered with all patients receiving Geopreza. And this chart shows the safety profile of Geopreza, and basically these are adverse events that are occurring at greater than or equal to 4% of the patients treated with Geopreza and occurring greater than or equal to 1.5% more often than other placebo-treated patients. Geopreza is only administered in the inpatient setting, specifically, primarily in the critical care setting. It is administered via an, a continuous IV infusion and is titrated up or down as needed to support blood pressure. As I mentioned before, current codes um, do not address the administration of human angiotensin um, II, and La Jolla requests that a unique code specific to the administration of synthetic human angiotensin II be added to ICD-10 Section X. In summary, Geopreza addresses an unmet need in patients with septic or other distributive shock. La Jolla Pharmaceutical Company received approval from the FDA on December 21st, 2017. As I mentioned, the current codes do not describe Geopreza administration, and inclusion of unique codes would assist in diagnostic billing and reporting, and also uh, identifying GEOPRESA and the ICD-10 codes would facilitate claims for providers. If GEOPRESA is granted NTAP designation, a unique code would be needed to identify cases eligible to receive additional payments. And now I'll take clinical questions. All lines are now unmuted.
Okay, as Ms. Detling described, there is currently no unique ICD-10 PCS code to describe the administration of Giapreza, a human angiotensin vasoconstrictor for use in septic or other distributive shock. Current coding, there is no unique ICD-10 code to describe the administration of Giapreza if desired. Facilities can report intravenous infusion of Giapreza with the following ICD-10 codes from Table 3E0. These codes are represented on page 44 of the agenda. 3E033XZ, introduction of vasopressor into peripheral vein percutaneous approach. 3E043XZ, introduction of vasopressor into central vein percutaneous approach. Coding options include option one, do not create new codes for the administration of Giapressa into peripheral or central vein continue to use the codes just described. Option two, add new substance value synthetic human angiotensin two to table XW0 in the new technology section, section X, to capture the administration of Giapreza. CMS recommends option two, a new substance value synthetic human angiotensin two, adding that value to table XW0 in the new technology section. Interim coding advice, continue to code as shown in current coding option. Are there any questions or comments regarding the coding options? Moderator, is the line open for questions as well? All lines are open. Okay, seeing no questions in the audience and hearing none on the line, we will proceed to the next item on the agenda. And my colleague, Maddie, will introduce the next topic. Do we have Amber Davidson on the phone? This is Amber, I am on the call. Okay, um, for those following along, we're on page 46 of our packets and we're gonna talk about transfer of prep use for reconstruction. The issue is in table zero HX, transfer of the skin and breast, the title of body part value A was revised from skin genitalia to skin inguinal in the 2018 ICD-10 PCS code update. Prior to that update, the procedure code 0HXAXZZ, transfer genitalia skin external approach, was reported for the transfer of skin and prep use for patients undergoing complex repairs for urogenital anomalies. Currently, the root operation transfer is not an available option in the male reproductive se section of ICD-10 to enable accurate reporting for this type of repair. We're gonna go ahead and have uh, Amber over the phone do the clinical portion. Okay, thank you, Maddie. Um, as Maddie described in, on page 46, this is kind of an unintended consequence of a code change just recently this past October. And so I just want to describe some of the procedures and conditions that these patients have um, and why we need a transfer table back into or added into the code set itself. Um, I'm on slide two now. Some of the conditions, and probably the most common is hypospadis, where it's just a male birth defect where the opening of the urethra develops abnormally, usually under the underside of the penis. It could be anywhere um, from right underneath the penis, directly by the perineum area, all the way out along the shaft. Um, distal and mid-shaft type is the most common, as well as it can be more proximal. Um, many times these patients also have a cordy, which is a ventral curvature of the penis that has to be repaired at the same time. Um, other conditions could be penile torsion or abnormal rotation of the penile shaft itself, as well as buried or hidden penis, um, penoscrotal transpositions where the penis and the scrotum are transposed. Um, so there's a lot of variety of different anomalies that this particular procedure could play into when they're doing these repairs and these reconstructive procedures. So I'm moving on to slide number three. 
Now, in this case, um, this is a patient that probably had hypospadis. Um, the penile, the urethra opening does not go to the tip. And so they're having to reconstruct the urethra, um, the penile urethra, um, using some of the foreskin itself. And so these flaps are made, created with the foreskin. These patients, once they're born and they have these anomalies, they do not do any type of circumcision so that this uh, foreskin tissue can be available later on as they start to do these repairs. And so the flaps are created and transferred and created into a new um, neo-urethra um, and then also rearranged um, to recreate the skin of the penis itself. Going on to the next slide, which is what they call the buyer's flaps. Um, these are also rotational flaps, particularly with the patients who have cordy. Um, once they have to release that urethral plate to correct the curvature, um, they'll have to recreate the skin covering um, and rearrange that tissue. And so, again, the foreskin is used to make those repairs. Going on to the next slide, um, these flaps also might come into play for a, a patient who has a failed surgery. Maybe the urethral, re, urethra that was created now has an opening. It's open to the skin of the penis itself, and so they will have to use those flaps again to cover and close those failure points where the urethra has reopened on the penal shaft. So there's a variety of different procedures that could be performed, and that's why we're asking again to have a table for transfer added into the code set itself. That'll do it for now, Maddie. <laughs> Thank you, Amber. Does anybody have any questions or comments in-house? Moderator, can we open up the phone lines? All lines are open. Okay, we'll go ahead and turn to page 46 of the agenda and handouts. Uh, under current coding, you would currently code reconstruction procedures that utilize the foreskin to repair the penile shaft to table 0VQ repair in the male reproductive system with the body part value S, penis, and the appropriate approach. And you'd code reconstruction procedures that utilize the foreskin for the urethra to table 0TQ, 0TQ repair urinary system with a body part value D, urethra, and the appropriate approach value. Coding option one would be do not create new ICD-10 PCS codes. Option two would be to add the root operation transfer, create new table 0VX, I don't know what happened to the slide. Let me go ahead. There we go. Okay. Add root operation transfer, creating new table 0VX for the male reproductive body system. Add qualifier values, urethra and penis for the body part value of prep use to capture procedure, procedures utilizing the foreskin for reconstruction procedures to correct the congenital malformations that were described. And CMS is recommending option two. We have comments. Lynn King, King Consulting. Uh, this really is necessary. We've had problems already on like October 2nd trying to determine what to do with these because of that previous change. So I think it was, as Amber said, in unintended consequence, trying to fix one problem we accidentally missed um, the fixes required for another one. So I totally agree with um, option two. Thank you, Lynn. I look forward to your comments. This is Linda Holtzman at uh, Clarity Coding. Um, just wanted to second what Lynn said. Um, I think this is an elegant solution uh, to an inadvertent problem, and I commend Amber and her group for identifying this so quickly and uh, coming to the committee so quickly to get um, uh, this corrected uh, quickly. Kudos to you, Amber. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments in-house? Okay. Oh, we've got one more. Do you have a question? Is this a graph transferring or a 
So it would be adding a transferring to another root operation. It's a little confusing. So when principles are performed, the skin actually pull and grab to the penis area or, or the area that need to be um, reconstruct. So the, the added new root operation of transferring, a little confused to me because when it transfers something, you mean you take from one body part to a next body part. Right, but when, when I'm trying to understand the PowerPoint and reading it, it basically gives a graph, right? Skin graph. It is, it is a flap graph. Right. So it, is not, it is not unattached from its blood supply, and this is foreskin that the patient was born with and is um, kept there until they might have these surgeries a couple years after they've been born before they start to do the reconstruction. So this foreskin is staying there until that point, and then it is arranged. These, it's cut into flaps to create these rearranged rearrangements to recreate a urethra or cover the skin um, as, a need, as the patient needs. So there really is no cutting off of that blood supply. It's not taking the foreskin apart and then placing it on. It remains attached so is and graph just rearranged. Currently, it well, is a flap well, graph. Yeah. So currently, what, what are we coding in a flap graph? Or is that a transfer? We never have a transfer here is what you add them in? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions on the line? Last call. The lines have been unmuted. Okay. We'll... Um, Continue to code as above under current coding in the interim, and thank you, Amber. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to turn to page 48 in your packets and our beloved Section X topic. So in anticipation of several comments today, as well as several comments that have been made in the past, we wanted to go ahead and have a gentle reminder about why Section X was created and the, the purpose of it. So as you can see, we have basically two uh, types of codes or two uh, reasons why we would classify something in Section X. The first is for new technologies that are not usually captured in the inpatient setting. The second would be uh, for new technology add-on payment policy purposes. Um, as we heard earlier, that uh, policy requires that a unique code be able to identify the technology. We did talk extensively about inter-body fusion devices just recently. And so many of you are aware we have a single device value that just says inter-body fusion device in the main med surge section. We've had in the past and up through today discussion about different what we'll call subtypes of inner body fusion devices. So uh, you remember a couple years ago we had the uh, Titan Spine proposal and a nanotextured surface inner body fusion device code was created uh, effective October 1st, 2016. Then last year we had the radiolucent porous inner body fusion device that was created. And both of these are Section X. Today, we discussed the peak interbody fusion device, the um, radiolucent with hydroxyapatite. So when we're looking at creating new codes in the existing uh, med surge section or in Section X, we need to ask ourselves, what is going to be, from a data collection standpoint, the most useful, the most beneficial? And up until now, we have not differentiated the type of material that is used in an inner body fusion device. That decision was made at the implementation, and, and it's in the guidelines. We don't have titanium inner body fusion devices. We don't specify peak right now. So when we're thinking about where do we want to place them, to go to Jolene's comment earlier, it's a, a fine line to decide, you know, because sooner or later, 
if we were to identify every subtype, we're, we were going to run out, just like we had in I-9. So collectively, as a group, that's, you know, we rely on comments and, and input to aid in the decision making. And again, um, the next section for the life cycle, we need to remember that we can delete X codes once they are no longer serving their purpose. Now, we haven't had any requests to date. However, um, by putting a code in section X initially, the purpose is to allow time for data collection. See how the code is being reported. Look at different examples of documentation that's being out there, and then be able to make, um, you know, decisions and recommendations for if and when we decide, yes, that belongs in the med search section. So those are just things to keep in mind as um, we continue down this road, because I'm sorry, but Section X is not going away. <laughs> and so we need to play nicely with Section X. <laughs> so um, in the past, we also got comments that um, codes in Section X are difficult to find, coders don't know where to go to them, and it's hard, but, um, you know, we want to, again, remind that we do make available in either late May or early June what we call the annual update or addenda files. So there's um, index entries, definitions, PCS table entries for all the Section X codes in addition to all the other ones in the med search section. And um, those codes do go into effect every October, just like the regular codes. And um, to address, you know, comments about reusing um, existing values, um, we have the conversion table that helps to address data trending. So you can go back any given fiscal year and look at what the previous code was and what the revised code title is. So, you know, maybe in certain situations it, it might have a, a bigger role or impact, but not in all cases. It, it's really not much different than just a revised code title. So um, the last point is that, you know, we also publish, uh, AHA publishes in its coding clinic publication code updates typically in the fourth quarter. So um, there are available resources to identify when a Section X code has been created. Having said all that, <laughs> um, you can think it over. Oh, we do have a comment. Okay. <laughs> I'll spare you all my thoughts on Section X. But anyway, my question has to do with the, the life cycle. Um, okay. I guess I didn't, I didn't understand from the beginning that it was sort of the industry's responsibility to submit proposals to delete them. I sort of thought, like Nellie and I were just talking, that some were sort of never approved for new technology add-on payments, but they still have Section X codes, and they're kind of sitting out there. And I guess I don't even know some of the earlier ones whether they're being used for any purpose. And I, get, I sort of thought, I guess, that that was your CMS's <laughs> responsibility. We share. Say, hey, there's no, the need that was originally, that this code was originally created for, no longer exists, let's delete it. But I guess you're saying there, that's not going to happen, and we all need to go back and look at all the codes in Section <laughs> Not say, necessarily. <laughs> yeah, it, it can, and what the timeline is, because this phrase yeah. of after they serve their purpose, well, who decides that, when, how long, at what point, you know, right. it raises all those questions. Right. Th thank you, Sue. And um, just, you know, to give a little bit of feedback on that, it, it is a shared responsibility. So um, we do, you know, encourage the public to notify us if they do have a request, just like any other code request. And then internally, we would also review at different times. And then we we would bring it here to the meeting and we would propose to um, delete the code. But I think there are some who never did yet. Yeah. So we have section X Yes, but n if um, we go back to the beginning, section X codes are not strictly for the new technology add on payment policy. Well, that goes back to what is their purpose? Mm -hmm. For data collection. I look forward to your comments. Go ahead, Linda. Um, I'm somebody that doesn't hate Section X as much as everybody else. So um, I've kind of got a slightly different perspective on it. But it does seem to me that it would be worthwhile to 
I don't know, every three years or something like that, run all the section X codes. Uh, you know, wouldn't have to do it necessarily every year or something like that, but to, uh, at least on a periodic basis, run all the section X codes and just see if they're being used. And if they're not, ditch them. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> hey, how we doing? <laughs> uh, so there. just uh, um, uh, those in CMS and several of the coders in the room have, have talked to me a lot. My name is Jeff Dunkel. I am uh, far from being a coder expert. Uh, I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for what you all do and the, um, and the value that you bring and, and correctly identify, excuse me, correctly identifying. I did want to kind of share one uh, quick anecdotal story. Uh, uh, Titan Spine, as Maddie mentioned earlier, did receive a Section X code uh, October 1 of 2016. Uh, uh, along with my positions uh, within Titan Spine, I'm also a healthcare strategist. So I sit on the Executive Operation Board uh, with the FDA's Medical Device Epidemiology Division. I work directly with uh, MDIC, with NEST, with groups that are looking to track real world evidence. And what we are finding uh, at least in utilization of our early on code is, is some pretty significant things. Uh, so mm -hmm. what, what I've noted or, or what I would like to note is, is both successes and, and fears, challenges that we are seeing from an industry perspective. Uh, the first is it takes a long time for data to populate, right? And then once data populates, uh, depending on the disease state, the standards for burdens of proof take even longer to go into a system. Uh, after a year, a little over a year and a half, uh, we were able to, pervert, to provide to CMS in the new technology uh, format in February our first four real-world evidence studies. So we are looking to insurance payers and providers. We are looking to EHR uh, uh, collaborators. We are looking to um, GPOs within the organization. Uh, we are looking to uh, FDA groups as well as MDIC groups like Hive. Uh, we believe that the data is out there. And, and the short-term um, uh, challenges that I see with NTAP, I believe, are 100% validated. When you start to see studies that do comparative analysis to other products and you see shorter length of stays, right? When you see reduction in opioids, when you see uh, improvements in clinical outcomes like return to form and function, that's the intent of the group. And, and so I, I, I encourage... Uh, that to continue. Now, as a challenge, one of, one of the biggest challenges is that we're often unregulated in, in marketing in this industry, right? And one of the values that the coders in the room have brought is visibility to that before I even knew that it was going to be a problem. Uh, the, the intent of, uh, of generating new technology, validating it works, is hopes that other people will try to follow in those footsteps, bring additional technology in, what we have seen in the market is instead people trying to change and shift their marketing tactics to angle in and, and claim the same technology even though they're not producing it. Uh, so since receiving the code, since, since validating improved clinical outcomes, improved biochemical response, cellular activity, et cetera, uh, the market has set a new standard. They've given this product a new premium, which is necessary because there's secondary manufacturing costs and, and we, we can't sell at the exact same cost, but it's not that far off, right? The challenge is when the market looks and say, says, oh, look, a new category in hospital pricing, I want that, right? Then, then everybody tries to jump in that bucket. And so uh, over the course of the last year and a half, 13 companies have misrepresented their information on the capabilities of producing nanotechnology. Uh, you all can back up this statement, but the FDA has a, a very thorough process to be a nanotechnology company. It requires the production of nanotechnology features at uh, less than 100 nanometers. Uh, it has to be so, uh, a surface technology that is not naturally present on a material. It has to show the ability, the, the company producing has to show the engineering capacity to manufacture those features in multitudes, inside, outside, throughout devices, uh, as, well as, as well as mitigate the frequency, right? So these are all very important, but most important, you have to show cellular and biochemical response. So I, I, get, uh, I get the challenges, but I will tell you that the benefits uh, are also there. And, and what I hope is that we continue to find a way, whether it's through device keys, whether it's through direct association with products, I hope that we find a way to, to not fall victim to individuals that just try to market their way into technologies that they don't actually represent. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Maddie.
Do we have any other comments in house about Section X? Moderator, can you open up the phone lines? All lines have been unmuted. Okay, we'll go ahead and turn to page 49 of the packet. And Rhonda Butler, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You can go ahead. It's all yours. All right. I am most ready and willing to be the last topic for procedure codes. And the, the even better news is that I think this is the shortest agenda uh, we've had for quite some time for CNM meetings for PCS. And so I'll try and just uh, zip through these and then um, leave time at the end for any comments from the audience or on the phone. Um, first, uh, as Maddie said, on page 49, we'll go over the proposed changes to either the index or body part key or device key. They'll all be listed in this index um, format because they will all show up in the index as well. Um, the first one, abdominal hysterectomy, that's just follow-up correction from changes that have been made to the code set, so we're playing catch-up here. Um, letter B, Billy Light Therapy, uh, it's not only a spelling change to make it more generic, but also a change to code assignment. These are all public requests for changes, by the way, and then CMS reviewed these requests. The letter C, uh, there are several changes to bring the device key in line with the current uh, device value and make it unambiguous. And those show up um, in several letters based on how they're listed, these spinal ligament body part values. <clears throat> or, excuse me, spinal ligament um, terms going to either the sternum or the rib body part value depending on the term. So, for example, costotransverse ligament is now, it used to be listed that you'd, you'd have to choose which one and we're eliminating, proposing to eliminate that ambiguity and costotransverse ligament instructs coders to use the ribs, bursa, and ligament. Um, the next one, costoxyphoid ligament. We're removing, proposing to remove the ambiguity and direct coders to use sternum, bursa, and ligament, and so forth. So those are repeated throughout this, <clears throat> this set of proposals to the index and body part key. Um, and I'll just mention them, I'll just skip over them when they're farther down in the alphabet. Um, letter D, uh, drotocogen alpha. Uh, there was a request to add the word infusion, and that's why it gets deleted and moves further down. Um, the downstream system has asked to have their um, codes for their system in Section 5. Um, the letter H. Um, there are various entries throughout here. This is in response to published coding clinic advice that eliminate, that clarifies procedures uh, performed on the elbow joint. And so those uh, index and also body part key entries will be added as well. So the humeroradial joint, rather than just telling people to code the elbow joint, it's been uh, made more specific that you code to uh, the bone that was required, uh, that was the focus of the procedure. Um, and there are others of those down further in the index. The letter I, for more spinal ligament instruction for the body part key. Um, letter K, a um, brand name for the substance key. Letter L, more spinal ligaments. The letter M, some additional coding advice just to remind people that mediastinal cavity and mediastinal space are coded to the body part mediastinum. The letter P, a revision to coding instruction for spinal blood patch. Also more coding, specific coding advice for the 
um, radio ulnar joint, and then the letter R, again, the more coding advice for um, radio head and radio ulnar joint. Uh, similar to mediastinum, a request to add retroperitoneal cavity to body part E and instruct coders to use the body part value retroperitoneum. Riodectomy instead of C face lift um, directs coders to the correct table. The letter S, uh, a request to remove the word mechanical from sclerotherapy and just says sclerotherapy C destruction, more, uh, more spinal ligaments, sternocostal ligaments. A request to add specific main term for supersaturated oxygen therapy. Uh, the letter T, one of those really amazing drug names. <laughs> Instruction to use, the, that will be in the sub, substance T. Uh, moving on to page can we can we just talk about 52. the index? Oh, um, Rhonda, hang on. We have a comment or question in house. Thank you. Hi, Rhonda. It's Linda Holtzman. Um, I Hi, just, Linda. I have a question about the index before we get to the tabular uh, addenda. Um, can we go back to the humeral radial joint and the uh, other joint? Uh, I, I must have missed something in coding clinic. Uh, um, I'm not I'm not clear on where this is coming from. I mean, if something is happening at the at the joint. Wouldn't you want a, a joint body part? Um, is this a spoiler, Nellie? Oh, sorry. Did I, Have, we've, did I miss something that hasn't come out yet? This, this is the EAB advice. The, the, what I can say is the general idea, after consulting with the orthopedic surgeons, is the general idea is that the elbow joint body part should be reserved specifically for that main joint, okay, not, not the humeroradial joint, not the, not the radial ulnar joint, the humeral ulnar joint, the big one. Okay. And then the other, uh, because there is such a significant difference in um, the seriousness, the outcomes, and so forth. I see. Thank you very much for explaining that. I'll be back up in just a minute after you do this first one on the, on the uh, tabular addenda. Okay. Are we good to go, Maddie? Yes, we are. Thank you. Um, so the, um, the first proposal in the table agenda is um, to expand the number of choices, the options for drug-coated balloon angioplasty. So the proposal is to add some additional sites. Dilation table 037, which is upper arteries, and 0. Five seven is lower arteries, and apply it to all the upper extremity body part values except the hand, um, and the device. I'm sorry, I said upper arteries and lower arteries. I meant upper upper arteries and upper veins. Excuse me. And the device values: intraluminal device and no device. And these changes are supposed to allow us to capture this detail for drug-coated balloon angioplasty of an AV fistula for dialysis. This is the request. And the examples are just below the, the written description that allow you to see kind of how it would look. I just want to clarify, it's on page 49 and it continues on or excuse me, 52 and continues on to 53. All right, the next one, extraction of hepatal biliary and pancreatocytes. Um, this is a proposal to extend some similar changes that were made to other body systems. It allows um, capture of using the root operation extraction to capture the performance of percutaneous aspiration biopsies and brush biopsies of these sites. And you can see 
in the example on page 53, the proposal is to add the root operation table 0FD extraction to those body parts listed. Next one, um, creation without using a device. This begins um, really at the top of page 54, and this is a proposal that's been um, revised from a previous meeting and brought back. In the heart and great vessels body system, the proposal is to add the device value V, no device, to the root operation creation table 024 for all body part values in that table. Um, this allows capture detail for procedures that do not use additional materials such as a graft or synthetic substitute in order to perform the pr procedure. Now, in response to public comment, CMS brought this proposal back with, with additional um, modifications, and those are explained in the second paragraph. In addition, the root operation definition is revised um, so that it correctly states that a device or material does not have to be used in this root operation. The root operation creation table 0W4 has always included the device value Z, no device. So the definition was actually inaccurate. And so um, if you notice, if you look at the revision of the definition, What's happening is simply the first half of that sentence is putting in or on biological or synthetic material to form a new body part is being changed to forming a new body part, and then the rest of the definition stays the same. We have a comment. Lynn Keen, Keen Consulting. <clears throat> I really can't tell you how sad I am to have to come up here and talk about this again. This, uh, this was discussed at the previous meeting, and I realize now that you have gone back and changed the verbiage of the, the root operation definition. However, the intent of this entire code is still completely inaccurate. This request probably should have never been made and this root operation change still provides significant overlap between supplement and now repair and this is confusing coders completely. The data that comes out of this misses the entire boat about how the septums are handled in these procedures. And I understand that you're making an attempt to try to make this work. However, I must respectfully say that although this work is good, this is the wrong work. And this root operation needs to go back to the original, and the correct ways to code this need to go back into place. Thank you, Lynn. Any other comments on that one? Okay. All right, next on the bottom of page 54, fusion using nanoscale rough surface interbody fusion device. Um, Jeff Dunkel uh, spoke to some of the uh, details of these types of devices uh, earlier on. I can read through this, but Maddie, I'll probably turn it over to you anyway. So do you want to just take it? Um, sure. So as Jeff alluded to earlier, um, there are different manufacturers, and his specifically has the nanotextured surface X code right now. There are specific guidance documents issued by the FDA that have clear uh, specifications or requirements regarding designating a device as nanotechnology cleared. So in an effort to try and avoid 
issues with questions and documentation, knowing that they're probably going to mention the term nano, and because of the specific NTAP application that's involved, we felt that it would be beneficial to go ahead and propose to have a unique device value that describes an inner body fusion device nanoscale rough surface. So as um, it shows on the bottom of page 54, in the upper joints and lower joints body systems of the med surge section, we would propose to create a new device character value, inner body fusion device nanoscale rough surface for cervical, thoracic, and lumbar joint body part values in the root operation fusion table 0RG and 0SG to identify spinal fusion procedures that utilize a nanoscale rough surface inner body fusion device. And the tables are shown as to what it would look like. And we have a comment. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to um, uh, point out again that I do consulting with Medtronic, and they have an interest in inner body fusion devices. But again, I'm speaking only for myself here. Um, OK, so this. When, when I first looked at this, I was like, what is this? Um, and then it occurred to me that this was probably Nanolock from Titan Spine. Is that correct? Is Jeff still here? Yeah. Okay. Well, just to clarify, the, the Nanolock is the Section X code. Well, so that's part of my question. Are we, are we going to go into Section X and get rid of the value that is currently there? No. So um, just to try and clarify. Please. Titan Spine has a new technology application right. that they're in the process of. And as we've heard today, that policy requires a unique code. They have their unique code. But apparently there, others are trying to glom onto that code or something. So I didn't say getting, that, but uh, that's your comment. And so well, it's based it, on Jeff's comment. And OK, I so mean, I, I never heard of it until until 10 minutes ago. OK, so because of the involvement of new technology and the fact that a device has to have FDA approval and there are specific requirements for Titan Spine's FDA approval that they've met. Mm -hmm. So there are other inner body fusion devices that maybe have demonstrated what's known as um, nanoscale properties or the range, but they haven't exhibited the effects. The other requirements right. for that FDA approval. Yes, and this isn't something that we've typically discussed at that meeting, at this right. meeting, mm -hmm. and I realize that, and, and this is why <laughs> we're bringing it up now, because it, it is a sensitive issue, and like I said, these inner body fusion devices and Section X, they're, they're not going away anytime soon. So I'm not this asking is, for them to go away. Yeah, this, so this was a proposal to try and address and um, differentiate between other manufacturers that may use and document the term nano for their devices, but are not similar to the other device that has an untap. I, underway. I understand the intention, and I don't disagree with the intention. I'm just not sure this is going to do it, because if people are, in my own words, going to try to glom onto that section X code, um, which is defined as nano textured surface, there's no reason that they won't try to glom onto nano scale rough surface. And as a coder, I have no idea what the difference is between the two of them, except, except some kind of real technical type thing. Uh, about the FDA, which I, I've never actually read that. Uh, I guess I could go out and take a look at it. But, but the, the point is, you know, I've, I've had trouble with this anyway, because I see the word nano in these procedure reports, and I'm like, well, as far as I know, the only one that, use, that should be using a nano textured surface, or, or at least the one that made the request, was nanolock. So I feel comfortable using the current section X code for nanolock, but then I'm like, is there somebody else out there, out there on the market? I don't know, because because these are not necessarily designed for one product. Anything, well, of course you know, anything that, that meets those those requirements uh, could use the same the same code. Now I understand that that your competitors don't meet that, but as a coder, I don't know. I, and I just I'm looking at this section X one for nano textured surface in this this um, uh, proposal to add nano scale rough surface. And I'm I'm just thinking that's yeah that's. I think that's just going to make the problem worse, well, not, not better. I'm, I'm, I don't have a solution. I'll, I'll, I'll try to come up with one. 
But yeah. off the top of my head, it, I don't think this is, that's going to be helpful in any way. Thank you, Linda. The thought process would, that would be that the indexing and advice from Coding Clinic, hopefully, <laughs> would help uh, if the code was approved. Again, it's, it's based on comments. That's why we're here discussing it. Go ahead, Lynn. Lynn Keen, um, I do understand the difference between these two services, but I agree with Linda that the coders will not be able to tell the difference. The only hope is the device key that Nanolock specifically goes to the X section, and I don't know how strong that is now, but I don't see that in the index addenda. So it, that, that needs to go with this if we have any hope of making this work correctly. And then a good, strong discussion of this somehow, politically, <laughs> in exactly. fourth quarter. I, I don't see any <laughs> other way to make this work. Uh, I'm with Linda. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Excuse us as, as we have this conversation. Uh, but if, you know, if the ABC, the uh, inner body fusion device company, um, gets FDA approved in, in February or something like that next year, uh, w having met the same requirements, then then they should use the code as well. So so we, I mean just 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 saying just having NanoLock in the in the index that helped confirm for me that that was the right place to go with with NanoLock. But I don't know if there's other competitors out there have had the same FDA tech, highly technical FDA approval. And honestly, I'm trying to get through this chart. And I don't have time to go out and look up the FDA approval for every single you know device that has the word nano on it. And, and that's the reason for this proposal, is that all the others would go to the med surge section and only Titan Spine would be using the section X code. Right, I understand, but hold on. But well, wait, wait. the word other? Would other help here? Um, we are open to terminology, you know, we can work with it. Yeah, but if somebody else gets an approval, it has cycle, to be, then, yeah, the, you know, then we're hosed. This is a very sensitive issue with the nanotechnology, you know, as I've said. But um, through direction, specifically from FDA, we, we would be able to determine. Okay. It's, it's like I said, I'm not, not opposed to making the distinction. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it's a good idea. I'm just not sure this is the way to do it. And I'm not sure that if we do this, it's not going to make things worse. Well, you so have till April 6th. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I agree that there's a need to make the distinction between these two technologies, but I, I'm getting nervous sitting there with people saying coding clinic is going to fix it because I'm kind of <laughs> going like, really? How? Sure, no. <laughs> so, uh, well, especially because, yeah, you know, I, we can look it up and see what does it say, what's the difference, but the ordinary coder is not going to know the difference, even, even if we put that information in coding clinic. Because, as Linda said, they're not going to have the time to try to figure out, well, you know, what kind of texture is this and how is this different? Because nanotexture and rough texture and, you know, rough surface, those words would not mean anything, especially if they don't show up in the documentation from the physician. And I'm sort of wondering whether it would. It, it's more likely to have the brand name. Right, the device. If for mm -hmm. the device, and yes, yeah. that will help. But mm -hmm. does that mean that every other device that has a different name that actually fits the criteria is going to come back and request to have their, their na name added to the device key? That's okay. I hope they do. Yeah, because that would be helpful. Because otherwise, they're not going <laughs> to be able to do, use that code because people won't know that they are the same. Um, so, <laughs> so I, you know, I mean, for other people in the room, if you have ideas on how to explain it to the coders without getting into some very technical stuff that <laughs> may not make a difference in the documentation or make a difference for the coder, I mean, please send your suggestions to Maddie and then she can share them with us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nellie. I'm back. Um, I realize I'm the person that fetched this morning about analogies to CPT, um, but honestly, that's what this is starting to remind me of. You know, you look at a new CPT code and the definition is so tortured and you're like, what the hell is this? 
And how does this differ from the one above it that has two slightly different words in it? And, and it, drive, it drives you crazy. And one of the things that I, that, well, for me it's not a long drive, but um, for, one of the things that I like about ICD-10 is that you can, yeah, condense. And, and I know what CPT is trying to do. They're trying to say, just use this for the FDA-approved product. But it reaches a point where you, you, you can't even figure out what the code is supposed to be for. So I think we need to be careful looking at, as I termed it, tortured definitions. Because it, it, just, it just eventually causes people to go, whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, tor torture the coders. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. And it just, I just thought of another thing. If, if Linda and I both thought that there was a possibility that the Section X code had been converted to these codes, then that means that the hospital could be using this incorrectly and miss their new technology add-on payment, which is even worse. So in any educational material that comes out, this somehow needs to be clarified that this is not a replacement of the X code. This is a different set of nanotechnologies that are not approved under the new technology add-on payment. And I'm sure Jeff would this, be the forerunner of that effort. No, the new technology add-on payment gets the money, correct? Yes. And this one does not get any extra payment. Jeff. We don't discuss payment at this meeting, no, we, though, yeah, so right. I want to just cut that off now. Uh, so, so, so just for clarity, I think that um, it's the responsibility of a company that invents a technology, that invents a new category, to spearhead uh, any educational information that comes out, right? Uh, and, and I think the way that we are trying to do that is through data, right? And so the representation that would happen in the event that uh, these codes were created, the, the onus that is on Titan Spine and the onus that is on uh, 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 our individuals is to make sure that we accurately represent the differentiation as well as possible. The, I think when, you, when you're talking about, the challenge here is that we're talking about a term of measurement, right? If every device used the word inch, how would you know the difference between one and the other? And, and we certainly understand that. The, the limitation is that the White House Office of Science and Technology, the National Nanotechnology Initiative, these groups that collaborated and said, we want someone to venture into this field and figure out how to use technology that doesn't previously exist in order to improve things like cellular behavior, biochemical response, and translate that to outcome improvement. And so part of, part of the onus that we have to take, understanding the, the pains that this puts on coders, is to make sure we have thorough education out there because if you don't differentiate, the risk that you run is people take the information on nanotechnology, take a misrepresented item, and then they force patients into earlier length of stay, uh, you know, earlier termination on length of stay, faster recovery, and that actually promotes more problems because the patients are likely to, to go backwards, right? So, so what I would say is, first of all, I am happy to host as many conversations as you all want to have uh, on on what this should look like. Uh, I, I have been in full support of, of, of Maddie and Michelle and uh, Michael and the rest of the CMS team who uh, are, are in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. How do you differentiate products that are so similar in name? Uh, I think that there will, I think that as time goes on, should, uh, should, should uh, um, a value be assigned to the individualized products or even just to the data itself, that we will be able to find a way. Uh, my hope is, my hope is that is to make sure that there is enough awareness within this group that we need to search for that path. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I'm on the same page. Okay. In the interest of time, I think uh, we'll just finish that discussion, and I look forward to getting creative ways to identify the other codes for the med search section, but I, I think uh, we do have agreement in-house that there does need to be a differentiation with another code. And Linda This is, is not on that topic. Up. No, it's not on the topic. Oh. It's, it's one that, that, that we passed. I was going to wait till the very end, oh, but okay. I'll, I'll just quickly, uh, it was the wait. very first topic on drug-coded balloon angioplasty of additional sites. Okay. I love this. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, Rhonda, I'm going to turn it back over to you for spinal canal bypass qualifiers, page 55. Okay. We just have two or three more uh, fairly straightforward and undramatic ones. <laughs> this is always good. Um, in the spinal bypass qualifiers, um, there's a couple areas where qualifiers are needed to enable capture of detail for bypass procedures from the spinal canal to some additional sites such as lumboatrial shunt and also um, adding the approach value percutaneous endoscopic. So some of these are being performed endoscopically. So if you'll, you'll see in the example, it's table 001. The proposal is to add the percutaneous endoscopic approach and the qualifier value atrium for the body part value spinal canal. All right, an additional one of bypass qualifiers in the anatomical regions body system. Another area where the, the qualifiers available were not uh, allowing us to capture procedures that are currently being done. So the proposal is to add the qualifier value upper vein to the root operation bypass table 0W1. So that's the anatomical region. The body part values are the pleural cavity, the peritoneal cavity, and the pelvic cavity. And those allow capture the necessary detail for bypass procedures where you're doing um, uh, a bypass from one of these cavities, like the peritoneal cavity, into an upper vein site, such as the superior vena cava. Okay, and then the example table show, below shows what that would look like. We're also proposing to add the approach value percutaneous. Again, same reason for completeness because the procedures are often performed using the percutaneous approach. And the very last one in the administration section, this is just a little follow-up tweaking to an earlier code that was added. Uh, there was a specific qualifier value added for influenza vaccine, and there was a follow-up request to add it to the muscle body parts. And it's already in there for subcutaneous tissue. And that is it for me. Thank you, Rhonda. Do we have any other comments or questions on agenda items, device key items presented? Moderator, can you open the phone line? All lines have been unmuted. Hello, this is Amber. I'd like to say something if I could. Go ahead. Okay. I'm going to go back to the creation without using a device. Okay. And um, addenda. And I kind of want to echo what Lynn Keene has already said. Um, when we originally submitted proposals for some of these congenital heart anomalies in March of 2015, we were really surprised when the, there was an option for creation because we were working with the constraints of the PCS system and looking for solutions without changing root operations. And so initially we thought, oh, creation, that sounds like a good thing, but I think it's just raised and created more problems than it is worth. Um, really, if you are doing a repair on one of these areas, um, these truncal valves or aorta, um, atrioventricular valves, it's, if there is no device, it's a repair. And there are ways to do that now. So I think this creation without a device, um, don't like it, and would probably not... Um, would like to see that one go through at all. Um, I probably would like to say I would like to take the creation out of, as a, as a root operation period, out of the heart system. It has just led to more confusion for the coders at this point. Thank you, Amber. <laughs> yep. I, I know I'll get your comments. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that 
about concludes the procedure portion. And I just want to note real quick that we will be posting an updated agenda and handouts packet. Uh, we're shooting for the end of the week to address the issues that were brought up with some of the uh, current coding proposals earlier. And um, I want to thank Noelle Manlove. This was her first time presenting. So everybody give her a hand. And Hava, I think, had to leave earlier, but this was obviously her first time, too. So you guys were kind. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Barcliffe, did you have any closing remarks? OK. All right. Um, Michelle Hudson? No? OK. Well, I will go ahead and turn it over to Donna Pickett to begin the CDC proposals. Uh, give us a few minutes to make a, a change. Um, one of the staff is going to come up and put up our laptops so that we have our proposals ready to go. Um, just so you know, we'll only probably go until about 4.30. Uh, we're going to try to cover as many of um, the proposals that we have that don't require a presenter or have PowerPoint presentation, which will allow us more opportunity tomorrow for the actual presenters um, that also have slides. So bear with us a minute while we make a change, and we'll be right back. Are we not connected? We, they don't have an input over there. Do they have one here? Um, there's one. I think we can probably use that. Okay, so you want to come up here. I, I mean, I just plugged it in the back. Oh, okay. Thought we had new technology and you waved at it and it appeared. Yes. We can go to the beginning and then uh, control click on things to get to stuff. Do you so want to do that? So, okay, where are we going? We're here. What are we going to? 
Sorry, what? Paragraph The paragraph mark is it? Yes, I do. Sorry. You got a view, huh? I'll uh yeah, I'll put that. There are other ways to view, but this is probably going to be best. What are we going for first? 22. Control click, and that'll get you there. Okay, I'll the page. Okay. <laughs> sure. So yeah, you can just um, you can you can use either. Well, arrow keys will will move the little cursor around, or you can move up and down like that too with the uh, page up, page down. Sure. Okay, we can get started now. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm not going to give the full overview and timeline uh, this afternoon. I will do that as part of tomorrow morning's meeting when we have more folks online that um, we're actually logging in for the diagnosis and rather than do it twice. Uh, I think once will be sufficient for everyone. Uh, the other thing that I need to remind people about for the diagnosis portion of um, the CNM meeting is there is a difference between the timeline for CMS for the ICD-10 PCS um, consideration for implementation and the diagnosis. All diagnosis code proposals you will hear today and tomorrow are for consideration for the October 1, 2019 update. They are not for October 1, 2018. I will repeat that again tomorrow, um, but I think this will help everyone kind of relax a little bit and know that you have um, uh, you'll have a little bit more time to kind of collect your thoughts on some of the proposals that you're going to uh, hear um, and also to put your comments together. Comments for this meeting's uh, proposals is May 11. It is in the timeline, but it is May 11, 2018. Um, and again, because of the complexities, and some of these issues are issues that you've all written to us about. Some of them we've had multiple perspectives, and we've tried to bring together uh, proposals that kind of synthesize all of the different requests that we've received on some of these topics. Um, and so we want to give you as much time to comment on them and also an opportunity to make sure that uh, when we do go forward with the codes that uh, we've had the best consideration about those proposals that we can. And some of them you will note since they are complex, some of them you will have seen um, in various iterations previously. Um, similar to some of the PCS proposals. So, but we thank you for those comments and, and you know, keep them coming in because, again, um, this isn't the low-hanging fruit. Uh, this is some of the more complex issues, and we want to make sure that when we try to move forward that we are getting it uh, done in the right way. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to Shannon McConnell Lamptey, who will lead us in the discussions for this afternoon. And we will end at about 4.30. If we're in mid-proposal, we'll finish off that proposal um, and then carry the rest over until tomorrow. So with that, Shannon. Good afternoon. If you will turn to page 22, the topic is Encounter for Examination of Eyes and vision with abnormal findings. This proposal was originally presented at the September 2015 Coordination and Maintenance Meeting. The American Academy of Ophthalmology is requesting new codes for an encounter for examination of eyes and vision when patients fail vision screening in order to be able to identify and monitor this condition. The modifications have been made to the proposal based on public comments and is now being presented for reconsideration. So the proposed tabular modifications at category Z01, encounter for other special examination without complaint, suspected or reported diagnoses, subcategory Z01.0, 
to add a new sub subcategory. Oops, two, four up. Let's go back. Bear with me. Okay. So a new sub subcategory Z01.03 to read encounter for examination of eyes and vision following failed vision screening with two new codes, one Z01.030, encounter for examination of eyes and vision following failed vision screening without abnormal findings, and a new code Z01.031 to read encounter for examination of eyes and vision following failed vision screening with abnormal findings. And the instructional note to use additional code to identify abnormal findings. Are there any comments or questions here in the room? It's uh, Sue Bowman with the American Health Information Management Association. I would just recommend uh, an excludes note, excludes one note, I guess, under Z the Z01 codes to make it clear if people got to those codes that if it's an examination following failed vision screening, they should go to these other codes instead. Okay, thank you. Any other comments here in the room? Moderator, could you please open the lines for any questions or comments? All lines are unmuted. Okay. Hearing none, you could please go ahead and uh, mute the lines and we will move to the next topic. That topic is going to be found on page 37. Okay, page 37, the topic is orbital roof and wall fracture. This topic was presented originally at the March 2017 Coordination and Maintenance Meeting. The revised proposal is based on public comments received and further discussions with the American Academy of Ophthalmology. The American Academy of Ophthalmology is proposing the following tabular modifications for new codes to identify these special types of fractures. The proposed tabular modifications at category S02, fracture of skull and facial bones, subcategory S02.1, fracture of base of skull to delete the excludes one orbit NOS, code S02.8, to add excludes one orbit NOS, code being S02 point B, to add excludes two note medial orbital wall, to add an excludes two note lateral orbital wall, to create a new sub subcategory at S02.12, fracture of orbital roof, with three new codes to collect the laterality, the right side, left side, and unspecified side. At code S02.19, other fracture of base of skull to delete fracture of orbital roof. At code S02.3, fracture of orbital floor, to add inclusion term, fracture of inferior orbital wall, to delete excludes one orbit NOS, and add excludes one orbit NOS, that new code would be S02.B, to add excludes two medial orbital wall, to add an excludes two note for lateral orbital wall, At the current code S02.8, fracture of other specified 
skull, and facial bones to delete fracture of orbit NOS. To revise these next two, instead of saying delete, you'd actually be, um, those are going to be revising those to excludes two notes instead of the excludes one. To add an excludes two for the medial orbital wall. To add an excludes two note for lateral orbital wall. And to create a new code S02.A for fracture of other orbital wall with the following three excludes one for orbit NOS, excludes two for orbital roof, and then excludes two note for orbital floor. Under the new code, we would have a new sub subcategory for S02.A1, fracture of medial orbital wall with three new codes to capture the laterality and a new sub subcategory S02.A2 for fracture of lateral orbital wall. Again, with three new codes to capture the laterality. A new code S02.B for fracture of orbit unspecified with an inclusion term, fracture of orbit NOS. And a new code S02. Point C for fracture of orbital wall unspecified, the inclusion term being fracture of orbit, orbital, orbit wall, NOS. Any comments or questions here in the room? Teresa Rehanek, Intelligent Medical Objects. Um, I think that the S02C code would fit better with the code specific to the orbital wall under SO2A if you wanted to include an unspecified orbital wall. Okay. Repeat the last one. Under which code would you? S02.A. Okay. Add another sub subcategory there to grab the unspecified so they're all together. Okay. Thank you. This is Sue Bowman. I don't have my book open in front of me, so I'm not sure if this might be a, a structural and space issue, but I was just wondering why uh, you didn't just create a new subcategory for fracture of orbit and then put all of these different sites under there, because I found it a little confusing to have the fracture of orbit unspecified and the fracture of orbital wall unspecified as the next code. Somehow I in my mind from the structure, I'd rather see all the orbit codes together and then at the end of all that you have the, you have the wall together and then at the end of all that you can have the, the uh, code for unspecified orbit instead of this particular structure. Okay, and I know that the only in, um, point that Dr. Repka did make is wanting to break out the walls. So he did want to make sure that we have those four walls separated. Um, but I understand the breakout in terms of going from orbit to orbital wall for a subcategory, so we can definitely look at that and have him, yes, take a look at that. Yes? I like Sue's comment, so mine is, is uh, OBE, but um, if, if it's not, um, under SO2.8, um, the fracture of other specified skull and facial bones, the third occlude, uh, excludes two, uh, orbital roof, uh, that could be S02.12, then the dash. One, two. Yeah, because the orbital roof is now one, two, and then it's got the uh, sixth character. I mean, it doesn't have to be. I really like Sue's idea better. <laughs> okay. So okay. let's just go with Sue's idea and stick them all okay. in one. Thank you. Moderator, could you please open the lines and uh, let's see if we have any questions or comments on the line? All lines are unmuted. Any questions or comments on the line? Okay, moderator, you can mute the lines and we will move. Uh, if you could please turn to page 45. The topic is presence of other specified functional implants.
Okay, so topic being presence of other specified functional implants. Neurostimulators are relatively common implanted devices and are used to treat symptoms associated with a variety of disorders, including multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. Similar to cardiac pacemakers and defibrillators, neurostimulator systems consist of an electrical generator in the subcutaneous tissue attached to a lead or leads situated at the nerves being stimulated. Medtronic is requesting an update of wording to neurostimulator for consistency. There was one place in ICD-10-CM that still has the terminology neuropacemaker, so they are requesting um, that we update that to be consistent. And they're also requesting a new code for the presence of neurostimulators. So the proposed tabular modifications at category Z45, encounter for adjustment and management of implanted device. To revise code Z45.42 to read encounter for adjustment and management of neurostimulator, brain peripheral nerve, spinal cord, vagus nerve, and sacral nerve, and gastric. And a new code at category Z96, presence of other functional implants, new code being Z96.82, presence of neurostimulator, and adding presence of brain, peripheral nerve, spinal cord, vagus nerve, sacral nerve, and gastric neurostimulator as an inclusion term. Are there any comments or questions here in the room? Okay, moderator, would you please open the lines and let's see if we have any questions or comments online. All lines have been unmuted. Any comments or questions online? Okay, hearing none, we will move on to the next topic. Let's try page 11. Okay, the topic is BRCA. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are the best known links to breast cancer risk. Women who have BRCA gene mutation tend to develop breast and ovarian cancers at younger ages than women who do not have these mutations. Given the limitations of current ovarian cancer screening approaches, prophylactic oophorectomy is recommended for patients with the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genetic mutation by the age of 40 or after conclusion of childbearing. This procedure has been shown to reduce the risk of ovarian, fallopian tube, and peritoneal cancer by approximately 85 to 90 percent in women with known mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2. The following new codes are being requested to identify specific BRCA mutations for statistics, tracking, and reporting. The proposed tabular modifications at category Z15, genetic susceptibility to disease. Subcategory Z15.0, genetic susceptibility to malignant neoplasm to create a new sub-subcategory Z15.01 for genetic susceptibility to malignant neoplasm of breast with three new codes. Z15.011, BRCA1, genetic susceptibility to malignancy. Z15.012, BRCA2, genetic susceptibility to malignancy. And code Z15.018 for other genetic susceptibility to malignant neoplasm of breast. 
Are there any comments or questions here in the room? Hi, it's Linda Holtzman. Um, did you say who the requester was? Is it ACOG? Um, this was a private physician, OBGYN okay. physician. Thank you. Um, I was just curious. And uh, is there a thought on, um, I mean, I have to say I don't, I don't code OBGYN offices that, that much. So um, I don't know if, if they typically do specify BRCA1, BRCA2, but is there a thought for um, should Z15.018 be used if they just say BRCA and they don't specify? Does anybody know if they specify? So you're saying if they're just saying BRCA with no other uh, determination of whether it's the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation? Jean Yoder, Ms. Yoder, on, can you Jean. please come to the mic? Yeah. We thank you for your written comments. Um, <laughs> no, because in CPT, if you look in the lab section, I think there's the BRCA1, BRCA2, and then there's other non-common variations. I think that's how it's in the lab section of CPT. So we'll just have to wait and see what comes in on those written comments. Okay. <laughs> Ma'am? I'm Dr. Jewell. I do some work with labs and genetics, and the, the third one, other genetics accessibility, that's pretty wide open. It doesn't refer to BRCA1 or 2 that you don't know. It, it opens the door to all sorts of genetics accessibility that could be coded under there. And that's what they want, except the BRCA1 and 2 is what the requester was specifically looking for. Um, and I understand Linda's point that if they just say BRCA, where would that go? So. Right, so can definitely um, take that back to the requester oh, and see her thoughts on that. <laughs> it wouldn't be meaningful for what she's after, right? Yes, I'm um, Teresa Rahanek, IMO. Um, it's my understanding that the title of the code should be complete. So shouldn't that code C15011 say BRCA1 genetic susceptibility to malignancy of breast? And they, the, a malignant neoplasm of breast and carry that through. And then if that's correct, do we need BRCA1 and 2 somewhere else for the ovarian? For the ovarian piece of it that it carries. Good, mm -hmm. good point. Definitely something we can take back. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that comment. I know it was very valuable, so could you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. Um, no, I, I thought that was an excellent comment. Yes. Um, and uh, it's Z15.2 is genetic success susceptibility to malignant neoplasm of ovary. So it sounds like whatever we do under Z15.01, we should repeat under Z15.02. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was Teresa, not me. Teresa. Any other comments here in the room? Okay. Moderator, could you please open the lines for any questions? All lines have been unmuted. Any comments or questions on the line? Okay, hearing none, could you please go ahead and mute the lines again? And we will now move to page 46. Okay, the topic is pyuria. We are on page 46. Pyuria is a laboratory finding in many diseases most commonly found in urinary tract infections. However, there could be other causes. Currently, pyuria is indexed to N39.0 urinary tract infections. There is no unique code for reporting pyuria. A practitioner's office has requested new codes to identify this finding when clinical exploration is being done to determine the underlying diagnosis. The proposed tabular modifications at category R82, other and unspecified abnormal findings in urine, a new subcategory R82.8, abnormal findings of systological and systological examinations of urine. 
new code R82.81 pyuria and an inclusion term for sterile pyuria for cases when someone was found to have pyuria and they've gone through evaluations such as uh, for infection or stones and there is nothing that could be found. Are there any comments or questions here in the room? Yeah, Jeff Lenzer, AAP. Um, I may be stretching my memory back, and I'm sure Nellie or Donna will remind me. I thought in 9 <clears throat> there was a code under abnormal urine findings for pyuria. And it is currently problematic because you can have a patient who has white cells in the urine uh, who may not necessarily have a urinary tract infection. So having a unique code uh, we think is very valuable. I'm not sure if we need a new subcategory if, at R82.8, if it could okay. be <clears throat> used with one of the other current uh, subcategories. We'll add that to our comments. Okay. But we definitely agree there should be a s separate code from this point into UTI. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments here in the room? Um, I, I agree with Dr. Linzer. I, I think it's a good idea to have pyuria have a separate code as a symptom code as opposed to uh, uh, automatically classifying it to a UTI. I just wonder, do we need some kind of, a, of an exclusion note at N390, or will the index be enough? Um, I, I ask because if people are accustomed at this point to just going to N390 for mm -hmm. pyuria, and they might not check the, you know, the index change. Okay. And so it, it might be worth reinforcing that with an exclusion note of some kind. Of course, someone with a UTI could have pyuria too. So I guess it would be, have to be an, ex, an exclusion two note. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Bowman, could you please come to the mic? I would oppose having an excludes two note okay. because I think I'm concerned that people might interpret that as meaning that mm. if you have a UTI and the symptom is pyuria, that the classification is advising you to assign two codes. So I don't think we want people to think that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish so Ms. Holtzman agree on, on reflection. Ms. Holtzman agrees with Ms. Bowman um, <laughs> that... Um, it should be an excludes one because pyuria would be characteristic mm -hmm. of a UTI. So it's one or the other. Yes. And so if you've got pyuria with no diagnosis Thank of you. UTI, then go here and excludes one on N390 to say pyuria only or something like that. Okay. Got it. All right. Thank you. To support what they are saying, the exclusion one, because often I'll provide you document pyuria urine, urinary tract infection interchangeably. Okay. So the exclusion one. Exclusion one. Okay. Thank you. Um, Teresa Rahanek, IMO. I also think you need an R82, 80, not 89 for other abnormal urine, abnormal findings on cytological and histological exam of urine. You have no way to capture that now if you only do R82, 81 for other findings. And there's not, okay. There's okay. not, because you expanded R82, 8. So you, you lost it when you went specific with seven. pyuria. Any other comments here in the room? Okay. Moderator, could you please open the lines? All lines have been unmuted. Any comments or questions on the line? Okay, hearing none. If you could please go ahead and mute the lines. We will um, now go to page 55 for a vertigo of central origin. Okay, page 55, vertigo of central origin. Central vertigo, by definition, is vertigo due to 
a disease originating with the central nervous system. Oftentimes, uh, it is unknown what specific central nervous system structure is causing the vertigo. And the central vertigo of left, right, bilateral, and unspecified ear codes that are currently at subcategory H81.4, vertigo of central origin, are not clinically valid. It would not be appropriate to report laterality for vertigo of central origin. IMO is requesting the following tabular modifications. This proposal has been reviewed and supported by the American Academy of Neurology. And the proposed tabular modifications under code H81.4 for vertigo of central origin would be something that we don't like to do, but we would be removing the four codes that are listed that are capturing that laterality for the vertigo of central origin. Are there any comments or questions here in the room? I see heads moving, but I don't see. Okay. okay. Yeah, I would. I would like to support this proposal. I agree. Normally, we don't like to delete codes, but I think if they're not clinically appropriate, then it's it's a good idea to delete them. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, moderator, could you please open the lines for any questions or comments? All lines are unmuted. Any comments or questions on the line? Okay, hearing none, you can go ahead and mute the lines. And at this time, I'm going to turn the podium over to Dr. David Berglund. All right. And we are going to look at page 39 at personal history of in situ neoplasms. Carcinoma in situ is where you have a group of abnormal cells that are just starting to become cancer cells, and you catch them in place where they formed, and you catch them before they've spread to nearby normal tissue, and then you can cut them out and be done with it. Um, at least that's the hope. And we've gotten a request to uh, update the codes that we have related to personal history of in situ neoplasms. Um, we had a few um, related codes at least presented in March 2017, and this is an update to that based on comments. Um, there are some specific codes uh, in ICD-10-CM for um, personal history of carcinoma in situ of the breast, of the cervix uteri, and of other sites. Um, and the Alliance of Dedicated Cancer Centers requested an expansion to include codes for carcinoma in situ of other additional specific sites. We've got a number of specific codes in the neoplasm chapter related to this, and basically they'd like more specific codes for the personal history also. So this requested detail could enable some better specificity and more accurate reporting of such diagnoses and be able to better track and then assess for risk for recurrence or potential need for future screening for particular cases. That's the goal. And we'll, it's proposed to add a few other additional notes at the same time. So at Z86.0 uh, and uh, Z86.00 is personal history of in situ neoplasm. And so we're adding a number of six character codes. Um, the existing code Z86.000 is personal history of in situ neoplasm of breast. It's proposed to add conditions classifiable to D05 the category where um, the in situ neoplasm of breast is um, coded. Uh, also at Z86.01, existing code, personal history of in situ neoplasm of cervix uteri, 
It's proposed to add a note conditions classifiable to D06. Then it's proposed to add a new code, Z86.002, for personal history of in situ neoplasm of other and unspecified genital organs. And we would have other notes here also for um, personal history of vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia, neoplasia 2, that is, VAIN um, 3, sorry. Also, personal history of vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia 3, VIN 3. Um, also, personal history of high grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia 3, HGPIN 3. And also, a note that this includes conditions classifiable to D07. Next, we would add a new code Z86.003 for personal history of insight to neoplasm of oral cavity, esophagus, and stomach. Conditions classifiable to D00. And next, a new code Z86.04, personal history of insight to neoplasm of other and unspecified digestive organs. An inclusion term for personal history of anal intraepithelial neoplasia, AIN3. And these are conditions classifiable to D01. Next, a new code Z86.005, personal history of in situ neoplasm of middle ear and respiratory system, conditions classifiable to D02. Next, a new code Z86.006, personal history of melanoma in situ. Classic, this uh, is conditions classifiable to D03. Excludes two, note for sites other than skin, code to personal history of in situ neoplasm of the site. Next, a new code Z86.007, personal history of in situ neoplasm of skin. An inclusion term, personal history of carcinoma in situ of skin, and these are conditions classifiable to D04. And finally, at the existing code Z86.008, personal history of in situ neoplasm of other site, uh, two inclusion terms would be deleted from here that now would have a more specific code elsewhere. And we would add a note for conditions classifiable to D09. That note should have a, a note saying add because that isn't there right now. And that covers it. So um, any questions, concerns, or comments on this? Um, seeing none, uh, let's uh, open the phone lines to questions. Do we have any questions? Comments or questions on the phone? All lines have been unmuted. Okay. Well, hearing no comments or questions uh, at this time, I will be turning the podium over to Tracy Ramirez, and I will check with her on which uh, topic she wants to cover first. Um, <laughs> Which one? Page 11. Okay. Page 12. Page 12, okay. You want to navigate there yourself or shall I? Go ahead. Be Just right there. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Good afternoon. This proposal is being um, represented. It was originally presented in September of 2017. Um, at the request of the um, American Hosp Hospitalization Association Coding Clinic, EAB. And um, it's being represented, um, David, how do I make it go down? Oh, uh, you, you oh okay, sorry, I, I was, but or it wasn't moving. Okay, down. sorry. And it's being re represented due to public comment that we received. And um, so at G43.A0, it was suggested to add migraine as the non-essential modifier. 
as well as G43A1 to add a uh, migraine there as well to differentiate the um, cyclical vomiting with migraine as uh, different from the cyclical vomiting unrelated to migraine, which brings us to the next, um, sorry, to the next um, edition. Um, we, are, we revised um, R1115, cyclical vomiting syndrome, and added unrelated to migraine, and also added uh, an inclusion term of cyclic vomiting syndrome, to include that as an inclusion term, and that's the only in new items um, related to this updated proposal. So are there any questions in the audience? Sue Bowman from AHIMA, I like this structure a lot better than what had been presented before. However, I'm, I'm confused about why uh, migraine would be a non-essential modifier because G43.A is, is in a migraine category, so it would have to be related to migraine to even be in this, in this category. So I think I would prefer uh, some terminology perhaps in line with the new code to say something like related to migraine, comma, in, not intractable, et cetera, et cetera, rather than having the parenthetical with migraine, which might imply it is with or without migraine, which doesn't make any sense in this okay. category. Great. Thank you so much. Operator, could you um, open up the phone lines? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. You were sitting down in the. Okay. I just snuck up on you. <laughs> um, me. Um, and while, we, uh, while the Academy does uh, support this, um, <clears throat> I think we had a, a, just a small problem with the way R1115 uh, is titled <clears throat> with the unrelated to migraine. And we think that might be better placed as a uh, non-essential modifier. <laughs> <laughs> so that contradicts what Sue just said? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if that's, that's what I was thinking, right? <laughs> Please put your comments in writing. <laughs> Operator, could you open up the phone lines? All phone lines have been unmuted. Okay. Since there's no comment, no more comments on the line, we will go to the next one, which is on page. Uh, let me see. Let me go to home. Forty. Yeah. Sorry, it's got a lot of stuff up here. Yeah, could you, do you mind? Okay. Yeah, 41. Okay. And this is um, as well a uh, representation. Um, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists is requesting a new code to report post-endometrial ablation syndrome. The original um, proposal was submitted, it was presented on September, in September um, 2016, and based on public comments, um, the proposal is, is being um, represented for consideration. Um, the public comment basically was saying it didn't Sorry, it didn't um, belong in the uh, category that um, that it was presented in. So we have now um, we have now um, placed it in the N99 um, section, and um, for new at N99.85, we were going to add it as post endometrial ablation syndrome. Are there any um, questions or comments from the audience? Operator, could you open the phone lines? All lines have been unmuted.
Okay, uh, no, no further questions. I am going to um, turn it over to Donna. Thank you. Okay, I think we have gone uh, pretty much as far as we can go with proposals um, that didn't have uh, PowerPoint presentations or uh, presenters this afternoon. Um, so with what, basically six minutes, seven minutes to spare, we, we will end the meeting. However, I do want to make an announcement, and some of you may be aware or you have weather alerts on your smartphones. I see people nodding at me. Okay. Um, on behalf of CMS, we want to give you um, uh, the phone numbers to check before coming here tomorrow if you happen to see that there are wonderful snowflakes and inches of snow on the ground, just to check to see if there are weather delays or closings. Um, so please write this number down, 410-786-786. 6010, and that's the CMS number. And then there's also an 800 number, and that number is 800 448 4232. Yes. 410 786 And then the 800 number again is 800-448-4232. And depending on which weather service announcements you're currently getting on your phone, the predictions are this area won't be hit at all to, oh well, we don't know yet, or four inches. So again, doesn't matter which station you watch if you want to know whether we're on delay here or whether there are going to be closings, which I sincerely hope not, um, you have the phone numbers to check before you head out the door. Have a great evening, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>